complex. Uh, all right, we're recording. And um, yeah, so these are tremendously complex communities with lots of different species, lots of different interactions. Uh, and uh, it's not obvious whether there are any general things that we can say about these communities. All right, so this is the general question, perhaps. Uh, but, you know, one of the primary ways that we have of simplifying uh, our, um, you know, and, and generating a coherent understanding of how these complex systems behave is if we can simplify the behavior or the dynamics in the form of some sort of phase diagram, right? So we know for something like water, you know, it can exist in these, you know, three wonderful phases that can be summarized in a great phase diagram, right? So if you look as a function of the temperature and the pressure, then, um, you know, there's the famous phase diagram that tells us, all right, so at room temperature and pressure, we might operate, say, here in the middle, and we know that, you know, water is going to be in its liquid state. Uh, and this phase diagram tells us that we can, uh, you know, we can enter the gas phase by doing either of two things. We can do the normal thing, which is to heat up the water and we'll boil it. Uh, but we could also actually decrease the pressure and uh, go into the gas phase in that way as well. All right, so these phase diagrams, I think, are wonderful things. We all love them. And um, the question is, can we generate a similar kind of understanding in the context of multi these communities? Now, when we're thinking about these sorts of phases, it's important to remember that um, different kinds of physical systems, you'll want to characterize using different like axes, right? So if, for example, if you're thinking about um, the transition from a ferromagnet to a paramagnet. Oh, he's talking about the icing model. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Then we have, um, you know, then instead of it being like temperature and pressure, it would uh, maybe, you know, we might still have temperature on one axis, but on the other axis, it might be useful to think about modulating the strength of the interactions between those spins, right? And indeed, modulating the strength of interactions is going to be a key thing that we do uh, here. Okay, so, um, all right, so the question is, is there any hope of doing something like this in the context of multi-species communities? And what I want to argue today is that uh, there may be, right? But if we're going to do that, then we have to start thinking about, well, what, you know, what do we mean, right? So first of all, what are going to be the control knobs that will allow us to switch between these different phases within a community? But also we need to say, you know, what are the different ecological phases? In the context of water, it was, you know, it was liquid, gas, solid. In the case of the magnetic systems, it was, you know, whether it was a, a ferromagnet or a paramagnet, right? So, okay, what, what do we mean in the context of a community? All right, so this is what I'm going to try to explain today. Uh, and in particular, I'll tell you uh, kind of two different aspects of these universal community dynamics. So first, I'll tell you about how simple theory, the generalized lotka volterra model, does predict that there are universal phases, and in particular, phases of species extinction and fluctuations versus stability. Okay? Then I'll tell you about our experiments that have recapitulated these key predictions from the models. And in particular, what we observe is that there's a loss of species, so species extinction, followed by the onset of fluctuations as you do one of two things, as you either increase the diversity in the community or as you increase the mean interaction strength between the species within the community. All right, so I'm just gonna start by uh, laying out some of the expectations from uh, the canonical theory within this um, field, which is this generalized lotka volterra model. All right, so what we have here, some number, say S of species, where the NI are just the population sizes for the ith species. And it's going to change according to just a few things. Uh, the key assumption of this lotka volterra model is that it's basically what you might think of as a Taylor series expansion, where the per capita growth rate of each species is just a linear function of the abundances of each species in the community, including the species interactions with itself. Okay. What I'm gonna show you in terms of uh, the expectations from the model is just what happens when we randomly sample. So each entry that is between different species is just gonna be a random independent sampling over a uniform distribution from zero up to some strength of inhibition. But actually uh, that is not an important assumption for anything I'm gonna tell you today. Uh, and then finally, what we're gonna do is imagine that we're really focusing on a particular community that has some dispersal of individuals from the outside world, right? So each of these S will not uh, at some low rate. And uh, we may need to 
you uh, somebody. All right, thank you. Uh, right, okay, so we were just, we have a focal community and then there's some small rate of dispersal of individuals onto the community. And then we wanna see what happens within that community. All right, so the, there's a lot of theory that's been done uh, both within the context of uh, theoretical ecology, applied math, as well as uh, recently, there's been a great deal of interest from the theoretical statistical physics community. Uh, and they have greatly influenced how we think about this in our work. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you the key kind of predictions from this theory that we think we can test experimentally. All right, so first what we're gonna do is just look at what happens if there are these 50 species out there in the world. And um, we're gonna focus on what happens as we slowly increase the strength of interspecies interactions or inhibitions. All right, so in the limit of very weak inhibitions, then all the species survive. All right, so they, they all survive together and they reach some stable state. And it's actually a globally stable fixed point. Okay. Now, as we increase the strength of interspecies interactions all right, that we're sampling from, what you see is that you reach some other outcome where again, it's a stable state. And we have that some fraction of the species are surviving at a reasonable abundance, but then some fraction of the species reach very, very low abundances. And we're referring to these as just being extinct because they're only surviving as a result of that low rate of dispersal onto the community. Okay. All right, so once again, this is a fixed point that is stable and it's actually globally stable. Didn't matter where you started. And then finally, if you, as you increase the strength of interactions even further, then you enter a very different phase where there are persistent fluctuations, which eventually indeed are provably chaotic. Okay. So here, some species are surviving, some not, and there's ongoing persistent fluctuations. Okay. So we can just summarize uh, what happens. So these are just three particular examples. Uh, and what we're going to argue is that these are really three different dynamical phases that the community can be in, right? Um, and um, what we can do is we can sample from this 50 by 50 matrix many, many, many times, and then plot just the fraction of the species that survive and the fraction of the communities that display persistent fluctuations. And what you can see is that there really are these three really qualitatively distinct dynamical phases. In the first phase, all the species are surviving and none of the communities are fluctuating. In the second phase, you start getting species extinctions, but you do not have any fluctuations of the community. And then it's only as you enter into the third phase that you start getting these persistent fluctuations. Okay. So these are the three phases that are kind of predicted by the model and that we would like to observe experimentally. This was all what happens as you increase the strength of interactions for fixed number of species. But we can also, also ask, well, what happens if you fix the interaction strength and you increase the size of the community, the diversity, the number of species in the community? And it turns out you go through the same three phases in the same order, right? So here, what I'm showing is just the species abundances as we go from simple to complex communities, right? So here with these three species, they generically will coexist all together in a stable way. As you go up here to 12 species, again, you see some fraction of the species are surviving, some fraction are not. And then finally, when you go up to that very diverse, complex community, you again get persistent fluctuations, right? So these were two different kind of control knobs that we've been modulating, right? So then what we can do is ask, well, what happens if we allow them to vary at the same time? Then we can define uh, what I'm gonna propose as a possible way of thinking about a phase diagram for a community. So on the left here is just the fraction of species of the S species that survive together. Black corresponds to all the species surviving. Then we enter the phase two where only some of them survive. And then um, up on the top right, you have survival that's relatively rare. And then again, we can look at the fraction of those communities that are fluctuating. And again, in phase one and two, there's no fluctuations. And it's only once we get up to that top right that we start observing these persistent fluctuations. All right, so these are the key kind of predictions from this jo uh, generalized logical Volterra model. And uh, what we wanna do is see whether we can observe these key features within experimental communities. All right, so yes, the question is, you know, do real communities display these things? Uh, you know, and of course, real can mean many things. In principle, what you'd like to do is go and look at the, you know, the community of fish and the coral reef, and you'd like to be able to experimentally change the strength of the interactions between the species and experimentally change 
the number of different species that could possibly exist there, uh, but that's uh, experimentally intractable. So what we are doing uh, is using laboratory microcosms of bacterial species. All right, what we're gonna do is take uh, 48 different bacterial isolates from kind of a broad phylogenetic range. And what we're gonna do is pick subsets of size S out of that 48. So S is gonna be anywhere from three or maybe even two uh, all the way up to uh, yeah, so two, three, six, 12, 24. And then we'll also have a 48 species community, but then of course we can only have one of those because that's all 48 species. Okay. So we're gonna take subsets of size S. We're going to inoculate at the beginning of the experiment, some S species together. We're gonna to allow them to, those cells to divide, grow. They're gonna secrete things. They're gonna eat things. They may kill each other. They do whatever it is they wanna do. And we're gonna perform this growth dilution cycle where each day we dilute just one in 30 of the cells into fresh media with fresh nutrients and everything else. And in addition, each day we have a very small rate of dispersal of that from that subset of S species. So it's really uh, like what we uh, were picturing in the context of the model. Okay. Now over time, uh, what we can do is make many different measurements. Uh, and in particular, we can measure things like the, um, the, species identities and abundances that are present within each community uh, by, you know, by sequencing. We can also measure biomass just by looking to see how cloudy that media is, uh, and also things like the pH and other variable environmental variables that we think may be important. Okay. So there's a lot of data and I'm not going to get into all of it, but what we have done is we have constructed um, 200 or more than 200 different communities and then probed their dynamics over time. I'm just going to show you uh, some of them. And in particular, what I'm going to do uh, is show you the biomass. But before doing that, I think that it is important to highlight that um, there is often this sense that, um, you know, microbes, because they're small and they're maybe kind of simple, that, you know, that, you know, that they have to maybe satisfy what you, you know, predictions from some simple model. And I think that that is, um, you know, very much not true, right? So this model that we are using to guide our thinking, uh, it makes lots of simplifying assumptions that are certainly not true. So these species do not saturate in a linear way, even in monoculture. So even their monoculture behavior is not um, correct. Moreover, uh, many of these species may display cooperative growth, which is another thing that is not captured within the model. Also, the assumption is that, you know, again, there's linear changes to the per capita growth rate in terms of the other species, which is again, something that is not true or not expected to be true. And it's also a purely pairwise model. There's no higher order interactions or anything, right? So the model uh, is very simple and is neglecting lots of things that we know are true within microbial communities. So I think that it's not at all obvious whether these sort of central predictions in the model will be recapitulated uh, in any community and in particular within uh, these laboratory microcosms. Okay. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and look at some data. Okay, so what I'm... Uh, this is a, a big slide and I apologize, but I will try to walk us through it sort of slowly. So what I'm gonna be plotting is the biomass of the community. So the total biomass uh, as a function of time. And each curve or each line is going to correspond to a different community, All right? So for example, here, this is the biomass as a function of time for various combinations of three species. Right, so each curve is a different combination of three species. And what you can see is that uh, different communities reach different biomasses, but not much is happening. It's all kind of stable. Right, and then what we can do is we can ask, well, what happens if we were to construct communities that are more diverse with a larger number of species? Okay. Right, so this is what happens. Um, and indeed, one of the central predictions of this model was that more diverse communities would experience more and more fluctuations in species abundance. And indeed, just based on biomass, you can already see that there start to be more and more of these kinds of fluctuations in the biomass of the community. So we've color coded the curves purple and orange, and that those are actually based on results from the sequencing. So we go and we do the sequencing and we ask, are the species abundances fluctuating? And if they are above a threshold, and it's the same threshold for all of the communities I'm gonna show on this slide, then we color code it orange. 
So um, and what you can see is that there actually is a nice correspondence between the fluctuations in species abundances that we assayed from sequencing and the fluctuations in the biomass that you're seeing here. Okay. All right, so this is already telling us that we can see one of the signatures predicted by the model, which is that more diverse communities with more species out there will experience more fluctuations. Okay, of course, the other thing that we would like to do is control the strength of interaction so that we can really probe this entire phase diagram. And the nice thing is that we recently uh, demonstrated experimentally that in this media, by controlling the concentration of two key resources, glucose and urea, we could experimentally modulate the mean strength of interactions within these communities, right? So what I'm gonna do is now show you what this looks like as we vary the nutrient concentration, right? So what I've been showing you up to now is just the medium nutrient concentration but we can go to lower nutrients down below as well as higher nutrients up above. And what you can see is that for these different three species communities, already there's some interesting behavior where at low nutrients, again, all those communities are stable, but when we went up to high nutrients, what we saw is that one of those communities is displaying these really huge fluctuations in biomass over time. And, um, and there's an interesting question of whether this is a limit cycle oscillation or something else, and we're looking into that, but uh, for now we can just say, there's the one of those communities starts to fluctuate persistently at high nutrients. Okay. Now uh, we can go and we can look at all these other conditions and see if it looks something like what we expected from the phase diagram. Um, and the answer is that it does, right? As we go to different six species communities, now we're seeing even more of those high nutrient communities fluctuating up here in orange. And we can fill this out and, um, and this is what it looks like, right? And so indeed, for example, here, if you look at the 12 species, communities, low nutrients, all stable, medium nutrients, maybe one of them is fluctuating, high nutrients, we actually have a majority of displaying fluctuations. All right, so, uh, all right, so, this, um, so this was just looking at biomass. We did sequence all of these communities over time. So there's a lot of data, but it's a little overwhelming. I just wanna show you um, some of these communities on the right. Oh, and I should maybe, sorry, mention that um, it, the, for the 48 species communities, those different curves are indeed actually replicates because all of the, for every one of these curves that I've shown you, we actually did it in triplicate. Um, and for the 48 species communities, there's only one possible 48 species community that you can make out of 48 species. So we decided to just show you what the replicates look like there. And what you can see is the replicates look very similar, right? Which is interesting. Um, okay, but now I'll just also now show you what the sequencing data looked like just for these 48 species communities, just so you have a sense of, of what the data looked like. Um, all right, so for example, here at low nutrients, uh, each color here is corresponding to a different species. Uh, and you can see, all right, we started out by mixing them kind of an equal abundance of the 48. And then uh, we can look at how the dynamics of the species change over time. And what you can see is that the community has pretty high diversity. A lot of species are coexisting together. And as expected, they're coexisting in a stable fashion, right? The species abundances are relatively stable over time. Uh, not only that, all three replicates behave very similarly. So these are the three replicates at the end of those 10 days. And I would say basically identical, right? All right, so that's encouraging. But now we can go and look to see what happens in say medium and high nutrients. And what you can see is that it looks very different. There's much less diversity, many fewer species coexisting together. And um, in addition, there's many more fluctuations. You can see the species abundances, they're kind of hopping up and then going away, hop, hop up, away, fluctuate up, going away, right? So you can really just visually see that there um, are these key features that were expected, which is that uh, at weak interaction strength, you have a lot of diversity and it reaches a stable state, whereas as you go to higher and higher interaction strength, we get less diversity and the onset of fluctuations, okay? So this is just examples of the sequencing for one particular community, but we have you know, 200 of them. Uh, we did sequencing for all of them, and what we did is we quantified the fraction of the species S that survive at the end of the experiment, as well as whether the community is displaying fluctuations or not. And then we're plotting it in the form of a phase diagram so that we can see if the, the basic features predicted are recapitulated. Um, and, um, and I think the answer is yes. All right, so on the left is the diagram showing the fraction of the species that survive 
And on the right is the fraction of the communities that display fluctuations. And so what you can see is, for example, here at the medium nutrient condition, uh, well, over here on the bottom left, the, well, obviously the single species survive, um, but also here, all the pairs survived at low nutrients together. So they all displayed coexistence. But then as we go up in diversity or in interaction strength, we enter into this second phase where we get, we start getting species extinction. What you can see, however, is that within this second phase, none of the communities are displaying persistent fluctuations. It's only when we go further up and to the right that we cross into that third phase where we start getting the onset of persistent fluctuations. Right. So um, our takeaway from this is that those simple theoretical models, although not capturing many of the details of what's going on, are actually sufficient to explain an awful lot of the statistical features of these communities. In particular, we can make predictions now about the fraction of species that are going to survive and the probability the community is going to fluctuate just based on things like the distribution of interactions within the community. All right, so with that, I will um, give some takeaways and then um, answer questions. All right, so uh, we, you know, we're really excited about this idea that um, these complex communities may nonetheless display kind of what you might call universal dynamical behaviors that can be summarized in the form of a phase diagram. Uh, and in particular, what we've been able to demonstrate is that these communities, they first lose species, right? If there's first species extinction, and then only later is there loss of stability and the onset of fluctuations. Uh, we are now uh, following up on this work in many different ways. Uh, there's a predicted uh, glassy phase that we are now exploring and we have some preliminary data um, demonstrating. And also we are exploring the dynamics within a meta community. You have many different communities. So instead of dispersal from an outside world, you just have dispersal between different patches, different islands or different whatever, um, then we've been able to demonstrate that this can also sustain diversity through just uh, migration or dispersal among patches. Um, all right, and with that, I'd like to thank the group. And in particular, uh, this work has been uh, led pri primarily by my uh, wonderful graduate student, Chilong Hu, with the assistance of Dania Moore, I guess now a former postdoc. And this is work that uh, was done also in collaboration with two uh, talented theorists, uh, Guy Budin and Matthew Barbier. So uh, with that, I will take uh, any questions. Okay, Jeff, thanks. That's a perfect topic for this community. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, let me uh, uh, start from uh, so, uh, Suraj asks, what about the variance strengths of the variance of the interactions? I think you talked about your early uh, yeah, model. No, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, okay, uh, you yeah, it, it, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I sort of papered over this. Uh, so in principle, at least from the standpoint of the model, um, the, what matters is both the mean strength of interactions as well as the variance of the interactions. And what, when, we, uh, when we modulate our environment by controlling the nutrient concentration, we're actually increasing both of those. So, so indeed, it's like in the model where you know, we have, um, we're randomly sampled the interaction strength from zero up to some maximum, and we're controlling that maximum. That actually is, that's, um, changing both the mean interaction string as well as the variance at the same time. And we think that that actually is capturing what's happening in our experiments as well. But we don't have enough uh, control over the environment at this time to be able to control the mean and the variance separately. Okay. So um, he, he, uh, his continuing question, uh, his, uh, he was asked, you use this Gaussian distribution, right? So what would happen if you uh, oh. interact in a correlated, a structured, non-Gaussian? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay, so okay, so first of all, we actually in the mo in the what I showed you, we used a uniform distribution, but we've also done it with the Gaussian and other distributions, and, and nothing that I said matters there. Uh, however, as maybe is being pointed out, uh, the we've assumed that the alphas are independent, like IID random variables, uh, whereas in you know in, you know in you know in reality, we think that they would not be. We think that they would be correlated, and uh, and and there's a lot of theory on this. Uh, so there, there's a broad range of correlations where, every, you know, where it doesn't really change anything here um, qualitatively. Uh, and we certainly think that we're within the, the realm of correlations where the, the basic features here are what we, um, what we expect. Okay. So Ashok asks you, are the species fluctuations chaotic? 
Yeah, so um, we have not demonstrated experimentally that they are chaotic. We don't have sufficiently long time series to make that case. Uh, from the standpoint of the model, what you expect is that when you start seeing fluctuations, many of them are going to be uh, limit cycle oscillations, but that eventually uh, they would end up being chaotic. And the limit of large S, you expect them to be chaotic. But um, yeah, so but we don't we uh, do not uh, know experimentally. So um, you 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 know when you experiment, some species uh, just uh, uh, extinct, some survives. Do you, when you repeat the experiment, do you always get the same set of species that survive? Yeah, the, the replicates are very similar, uh, just yeah. like in the case of that, um, you know, the 48 species community, um, you, you know, that I showed you. Yeah, like here, um, you can see that the, the, these are three different experimental replicates where we mixed these 48 species together and then we did sequencing after 10 days. And what you can see is that they, you know, they look the same, right? Hmm. Yes, the replicates are surprisingly similar. And that's even true in terms of the dynamics. You know, when you see um, the fluctuations, many of the fluctuations are, they, they at least start out being similar. You could take that as evidence that they're not chaotic, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it's also a short time series. So even a chaotic fluctuation would start out being the same if you start at the same place. It's just that they diverge over time. Okay. So uh, Marco Pauli and Mark Lowe they asked you uh, sort of a similar question is that the relation between nutrient, chain nutrient concentration and the interaction stress. Yeah, so this is an interesting thing is if you write down a nutrient, an explicit nutrient model, this is not what you would expect. Um, you know, I didn't have time to get into it, but um, you know, one mode of interaction uh, that is, for example, modulations of the environment. So basically when you have more nutrients, you have more growth, and then if you have more growth, you can change the environment more dramatically. In particular, you can change like the pH and some other things. Uh, so some fraction of the interactions within this community uh, at high nutrients, we think are modulated by the pH. Okay. Uh, Jun Chen asked, what, why, is the, uh, why is an oscillating community necessary and stable? Oh yeah, so I, I think that the statement there is just imagine slowly increasing the interaction strength with a given community. Right. So what that means is that it's like it starts out in phase two being stable, but then as you just slowly turn off the interaction strength, then, um, you know, then you get the oscillations. And that's basically because that fixed point became unstable. So this is this is very much like the classical ideas of loss of stability by analyzed by May um, in the context of random matrix theory. Uh, it's a little bit more subtle than that, but um, but yeah. 